we were literally in St. Mark's Square um, filming pigeons. Um, and all of a sudden, that opening shot of a seagull uh, coming down and, and, and grabbing a, a pigeon, that just happened. That's, oh, uh, wow. Gosh. That is not a planned, uh, scripted, but we thought, oh, my God. You know, but those things only, I don't think unless we were so diligent in that we would be nimble, we will spend, we will be a small crew. We will be, not that I, I wish any harm on pigeons, but um, <laughs> uh, it just, it, that is, that's kind of life captured in Venice at that particular time. And I think it's timeless and um, it shows the, the cycle of life in a, in a, in a poetic way that was not planned, but um, very well received. <laughs> Hi, Harris. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Jen? Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Yeah, we are. We're doing wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us on the movie podcast and congratulations on the film. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you, before we kind of get into Haunting in Venice, we want to talk about really quickly one of our favorite movies that you had a chance to, to shoot, which was Locke. I feel like a lot of the similar uh, styles were used with this movie where close ups with these like claustrophobic kind of moments. It, it, can you speak on that a little bit? In some respects, yes, they're very similar in that um, there were huge limitations on Locke in time and space and uh, turning the car into a character. And Haunting was was similar in that um, we were we were kind of uh, we had time constraints and schedule constraints. So we felt with Ken that we should. Um, turn that into a positive and and make some rules of engagement in a way uh, so the camera doesn't move very much um it's very intimate it's very personal and when it does move you've got to i actually much like a car where you connect it to the bonnet of a car we we, we connected a camera to kenneth um with a body cam rig and and that's how you actually that's how you, so you discover certain locations like the um like the basement, et cetera, you, you through, he discovers it for the audience in a way, and the camera's attached to him. We didn't use steady cam or traditional methods. So those constraints, you know, in a way, they, they became um, our, our, our language rather than our, our, our become a limitation. I love that. And yeah, those, those shots of Kenneth walking through those corridors um, are so unsettling and you and you feel what he's feeling in those moments so like you definitely captured that that the haunting within that within that house um now I, we have to ask you know you worked with kenneth and all three of the perot films how did you approach making venice feel distinct but also within the same world of death on the nile and murder on the orient express that's a very good question it's it was hard um i guess one of the first things that we felt was that there was something we really enjoyed with Belfast and that there was something about the portraiture, something about the aspect ratio that we changed from 240 to 185 on Belfast that, and, and what that did in that it, it allowed the landscape to speak a little bit more, that the use of negative space was, was easier to accommodate with 185 than it was with 240. The use of weather would seem to be easier to use with 185, i.e. background rain and thunder. So all those things were, were things that we took away from, from Belfast and, um, uh, and, and that very, very intimate kind of portraiture that we did on, on Belfast was a way of getting in on the kind of human condition story of of haunting in venice because it's of all the three films we've done this was in my in my mind the most horrific crime of all and therefore led itself to a, a haunted story because uh, you know it, it's it's quite uh, it's quite evocative that way but it it had to be felt rather than seen um and it had to be from a particular uh, point of view so i guess those things were very important to us and i think the other films had more of a you know agatha christie wrote all these stories where she traveled the world and she'd write about them in such detail and and with such passion that you as the reader would get to travel in a time when travel was really difficult and and, and expensive so um uh, she she lived for the the people of her generation in in that way and those were 
were parts of the story um, in those previous films. They were not so, although Venice is a very key and very important part of this story, the idea that you, you view this city through her eyes, in a way, it is not, uh, was not as significant. It, it, it is a conduit to the human uh, soul and the human condition and this particular uh, haunted crime. It, it's wonderful, too, because you look at just the beautiful landscapes of Venice and, and, and Italy, and then you shoot within the singular location. And you really feel that sense of dread within, you know, within that mansion. What was it like shooting for you in that singular location and really feeling like Shay was saying earlier, like that claustrophobia of, you know, that the like so that there could be an evil presence within this house? <laughs> Well, in the house itself, I mean, that was a stage in the end that we had to 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 build. We did shoot in real Venice, and that palazzo exists. It's it, in its modern way right now. It's in apartments, and you you and and it's obviously modern. Um, but I, I guess that that claustrophobicness becomes much like the car in lock. It just becomes one of your um, your tools, and also it's it's how you shoot Venice and when you shoot Venice. So we went very early in the morning. And we shot all our vistas. I mean, extreme. We started when it was dark and we pretty much ended a little bit after when the sun went up. And it's a very different place. And and that seems to be timeless. Like, that's the part of Venice that seems to be the same um, throughout the ages. Whereas, you know, around about 10 o'clock when there's tourists and, and visitors and, and, and shopkeepers, etc. It's a very different and a very contemporary Venice. And... Just little, th we. I think by being, we were very nimble. We were very, a uh, very small crew in Venice, and we we just captured these moments. And we saw little things like we saw that, you know, there were way more birds in the morning. So we we shot a lot of birds in the morning, and we were literally in St. Mark's Square um, filming pigeons. Um, and all of a sudden, that opening shot of a seagull uh, coming down and 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 grabbing a a pigeon that just happened. That's oh uh, my gosh. that is not a plan. Uh, scripted but we thought oh my god you know but those things only i don't think unless we were so diligent in that we would be nimble we will spend we will be a small crew we will be not that i i wish any harm on pigeons but um <laughs> uh, it just it that is that's kind of life captured in venice at that particular time and i think it's timeless and um it shows the the cycle of life in a in a in a poetic way that was not planned but wow. uh, very well received <laughs> yeah what a what a way to start the film it definitely like kept us on edge the rest of the movie yeah we had a chance to speak with Hilda about you know the composition of the score and she she mentioned a lot about how she really went back to that that era and and used a lot of the the, the motifs from that time I, I'm curious for you did you try to shoot differently at all in a way where you're like, okay, I want to try to really embody the 1940s in this. Were there any tactics you used or any styles that you really wanted to incorporate? Um, well, she's done a brilliant job with the score. It's, it's mesmerizing. Um, and I've been a big fan of hers for years. Uh, it, for me, I, I felt one of the things I wanted to do, uh, which was, uh, was to use contemporary lighting. Uh, and at that time it was a mixture of candlelight and, um, tungsten uh, lighting we found original lighting fixtures um and we we, we used kind of uh beeswax candles i mean down to that level of uh, uh what kind of wax would they have used etc and then we had to find kind of lenses and cameras that were would work in those environments now in the past i think from a cinematography point of view that's relied on you know, ASAs have only gone so far, you know, they've never really gone past the, the 500, 800 uh, mark. And we've had to rely on uh, fast lenses in the 1.4 T1 area. And, and all films, however beautiful they are, they have something for me in, in that uh, aspect in motion picture where because both eyes are not always in focus and your focus puller has to choose one eye um, uh, most of the time to, to rack focus to that I find that can be after a while distracting. I know that you, we've sometimes had to almost soften a lens in general. Um, when I work with Panavision that, that we, we might soften a, uh, if we want to go to a lower uh, f-stop, just do that just to give it all that look. But I 
I think we've given a look to the Poirot films that is extreme high fidelity. We've worked in 65 mil film before. We've worked at really low ASAs. And in this case, I wanted to shoot in candlelight and real incandescent kind of lighting of the period and stay at T4, have both eyes in focus and just uh, give a a depth of field that's not extensive. We're not talking Citizen Kane depth of field, but just what I felt was a kind of enough for intimacy and for uh, the, that lack of distraction. So the Sony Venice 2 cameras had come out and they were appropriately named and of adequate <laughs> uh, ASA, um, 3200 ASA, um, to pair up with some of the best glass, I think the crown jewels of Panavision, which they've kept for many, many years, and they've not had much use until until recently because they s seem to match um, our kind of medium format digital sensors of the time. And they're the Ultra Panatars and the Auto Panatars. They were created for Ben Hur, and they make 65 mil into a 2.67 aspect ratio, a super wide almost Cinerama aspect ratio. And they've not been useful really for other. Um, either 35 mil or previous digital format. But paired with the Sony Venice, they give you an almost perfect 185 aspect ratio. So that seemed to give us something that was incredibly lucid, incredibly clear, and yet we could shoot at below eye level darkness, which also had an impact on our um, cast. So they really did feel like they were living in that environment definitely yeah you, you see that throughout the film and it really is just a beautiful film to look at you know uh, unfortunately we are out of time but i just really do want to say before we wrap we cannot wait to see what you do with beetlejuice 2 next year uh we'll be careful not to say the name anymore no um no, in case we have it popping up harris thank you so much for your time thank you thank you guys pleasure talking to you